Moses went to the mountain, and God spoke unto him. Moses, this is the Lord thy God commanding you to obey my law. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you, I hear you. A deaf man could hear you. What? Nothing, I punished you, forget it. Oh, Lord, why have you chosen me? What would you have me do for you? I shall give you my laws, and you shall take them unto the people. Yes, Lord! Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me! Oh, hear me! All pay heed! The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these fifteen... Oy. Ten! Ten commandments for all to obey! I was chanting uh, in the temple room, going back and forth, and he walked up to me and he said, So, Dr. Pat, uh, what's your plan? I said, Well, Prabhu, I've decided I'm going to be traveling to India. He said, Really? For what? And I said, uh, I've got to find a guru. He said, Why do you think you have to go to India for that? I said, Well, I don't think there's too many gurus running around here in Detroit. And uh, I pulled out my Isha Upanishad and I showed him exactly what Prabhupada said this. And he said, oh, come here. And he grabs me by the hand, and he literally holds my hand and walks me over to the Vyasasan of Srila Prabhupada with the picture of Prabhupada. And up till this point in time, and I cannot explain why this is so, but I never really took note of the Vyasasan or Prabhupada's picture on the Vyasasan. I've been coming to the temple for a couple of weeks. It was just one of the pictures in the temple, okay? And then he said, this is your guru. He's actually everyone's guru. You don't have to go to India to find a guru. He's here. And at that moment, I looked at Prabhupada's picture, and then it was like whoosh, the curtain was pulled back, and now Srila Prabhupada pervaded everything. I couldn't look at anything in the temple the same way. I couldn't look at anything about the devotees the same way. Everything was pervaded with this connection to Srila Prabhupada. And so then it was just a matter of time before I finally just said, okay, that's it. I want to give, uh, give this a try, is what I basically said. And so I moved into the center with the devotees there in Detroit, 8311 East Jefferson and um, began to mine all of the different devotees that had any experience with Srila Prabhupada. Karandar met me in 1970 at the Portland Temple and decided that he wanted me to become his assistant in working for the book publishing. So in 1971, he brought me to New Dwarka and he personally trained me throughout 71, 72, and 73. And then the unimaginable happened and Karundar left at the end of 73, which was a shock. And Jayatirtha and I flew immediately to Hawaii to visit with Srila Prabhupada. And at that time, Prabhupada was asking us, how will things go on? And the conclusion was that Karundar's jobs would be split. Jayatirtha would handle the zonal responsibilities and I would handle the BBT responsibilities. So in 1974, early 74, I made an official BBT visit to our Brooklyn temple where ISKCON Press was located. 
I'd been to the temple a number of times as a book distributor and as a preacher about book distribution, but not in this capacity as the BBT manager. So I met with Bali Mardan and I met with the press devotees and the artists to discuss production in 1974. What are we going to be producing? I have to know, because now I'm handling the publishing. So we were getting ready to reprint two books, the TLC, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya, and the Krishna book. The, one of the artists had been working for the better part of, a, of almost a year on line drawing sketches that would appear in every chapter of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. The other devotees had been regularly painting for the Srimad Bhagavatam. We were up to the third canto already. And they had this idea that in the reprint of the Krishna book, some of the paintings in the original were done in 68, 69, you know, early 1970. The artist's technique had gotten much better. They thought that the paintings today, look, in 74, look more realistic. So they had proposed to me that they were going to take out some of those paintings and insert some of the newer paintings that they had been doing for the Bhagavatam that also happened to deal with Krishna Leela. Okay, so it was my task to fly back to L.A. Prabhupada was getting ready for his 1974 visit and present all of this to Srila Prabhupada as my first official meeting and act as a BBT manager. So Prabhupada was in his room and I came up and we started off by showing him the drawings of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. And one by one by one, Prabhupada was commenting and rejecting them for various reasons. Prabhupada liked the original drawings as simple as they were that had been done by Govinda Dasi and Gorsundar. These drawings, while technically, I think, superior, lacked in so many ways, according to Srila Prabhupada. In one drawing, the Goswamis, Rupa and Sanatan, were absent. In another drawing, one of the Goswamis was sitting on the same level as Lord Chaitanya. I mean, on and on, Prabhupada would tear apart these drawings. And as he kept going through them, he was getting angry. Now, I don't know if any devotee had ever seen Srila Prabhupada angry before. I certainly had not. So it was, it was a shock and it was scary and it was... I was very frightened. <laughs> and it, the conclusion was we weren't going to use any of those drawings. So then I had to now bring out the Krishna book and start to show Prabhupada the paintings that the artists wanted to take out and the press devotees wanted to take out and the new ones that they wanted to insert. So I introduced the topic and Prabhupada said, they want to add paintings? I said, no, Srila Prabhupada, they want to replace paintings, not add. In some cases, they are the same scene, they think they painted it better. In other cases, they want to replace, they want to take out paintings that they think were painted too long ago and they're not painted in a serious way and insert other paintings, not of the same Leela, but just because they're technique, technically better. Prabhupada said, what? You have no authority to do that. You have no authority here. Once a painting has been approved, you can't remove it. If you want to repaint that pastime, and if the new painting is better, shows more detail, shows more Leela, more character, uh, that might be considered. But just to take one painting out, to put a different one in, no, you cannot do that. He said, once I have approved something in my books, it is eternal. Once a painting is approved, it is eternal. You have no authority. I said, oh, okay. So I said, do, do you want me to show you what they're proposing? And very unhappily, he said, okay. So I started to show Srila Prabhupada the paintings, one by one, that they wanted to insert. One of them was a painting of Krishna killing Putana. 
Now, we had a painting of Krishna killing Putana, so this, I think, would have fit the category of we're taking an old one out and putting in a better one. Prabhupada looked at it. He made a face. This was printed in the second canto. I don't know if they still use it. And Prabhupada said, that is an ugly black mass. That is not superior. Reject it. Okay. And on and on, I showed Prabhupada a painting of Krishna sitting on the rocks, which I thought was beautiful. Prabhupada thought his hair was too long and wild. Rejected. And besides, you want to take, you don't want to add, you want to take out a painting that I have already approved for that? No, reject it. And as I kept showing Srila Prabhupada these paintings, the anger that it started with the line drawings for TLC had grown to almost like roaring proportions. At one point, he was pounding his fist on the desk, saying, this is what I'm afraid of, that you will make changes in my books that will ruin them. No, you have to get permission. You cannot do this. So finally, I had one last painting to show Srila Prabhupada. I said, Prabhupada, they want to take out the painting of the Raslila and insert this new painting of the Raslila that appeared in the third canto. Prabhupada didn't say a word for a moment. From his sitting room, he can look into his bedroom where he sees this beautiful painting of the original Raslila that Devahuti did hanging on his wall. So he's looking at that painting. Then he looks back at the print of the painting that I wanted, to, that we wanted to put in his book. I said, you think this is better? This is a hippie dance. Their heads are not covered. Krishna's hair is wild. The gopi's hair is wild. Hippie seed. Hippie dance. Rascals. They're all rascals. Prabhupada was so angry, he was banging his fist and yelling at me. At that time, his servant Sudama uh, came running in because he heard the yelling. He couldn't imagine what it was. He opens the door. He sees Prabhupada like Nishringadev. He couldn't even get down to offer his obeisances. He was so terrified. He stood in the doorway. On one foot, he lifted himself up with his other foot and covered his eyes. He couldn't bear to see the scene. And then Prabhupada said to me, get out. And he threw us both out. It was the first of many lessons that Prabhupada gave me about making changes in his books. On that walk, Srila Prabhupada talked about a few different things. One of them being who actually started book distribution in a big way in America. It was just a sort of random discussion that was born out of something else, you know. And um, so Srila Prabhupada, uh, different people were saying different things. People said Keshava, Budimanta, Karandar, they were offering different people, right? And Prabhupada stopped and he went, no, no. Uh, Jayananda. Hmm? Jayananda, he, he began. So Jayananda happened to be on that walk and he was in the back and Prabhupada waited for him to come forward. Prabhupada said, Jayananda. And Jayananda immediately comes up, yes Prabhupada. And it was classic Jayananda Prabhupada. Jayananda real tall, looking down into Prabhupada's eyes, loving, you know, relationship. And he goes, it was you, wasn't it? You? bought the first uh, printing of uh, uh, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. $5,000. Then Prabhupada looked up, yes, he did. And then Jayananda went, I don't know, Srila Prabhupada. Like, I don't know if that was the first, you know. And Prabhupada said, no, yes, that, that was the first. And, and he was, you know, confirming for everyone around. So, um, and I was just watching this, like everyone else would do, you know and it was blissful, but um, as Prabhupada began to walk again, uh, I was trying to hear him a little better, you know, and I was off in the back and the side a little bit, so I began to kind of weave like a race car driver, you know, as 
carefully as I could and weave a little bit, get in a little closer, get a little closer. Finally, I was directly behind Prabhupada, but off to the left and a little bit back. And I was keeping track of Prabhupada, how he was walking, his feet, and so on like that. He had a kind of rhythm with his cane. And I was walking, and then suddenly Prabhupada stopped with a no notice. He didn't even slow down, he just stopped. And I accidentally stepped into the heel of his foot. Not hard, you know, just enough that he noticed I was there. And he turned around. This is the first thing that happened. And I don't know if you remember this, but um, he turned around. He put his cane right in my stomach. And he looks and he goes, don't come close. <laughs> and I was, uh, you know, mortified, shocked. The rest of the walk, Reed Ayanandamaraj kept looking at me and kind of signaling, you know, get back, get back. And uh, I was real nervous at that point to proceed any further. But when I came back from the walk, Rameshwar said to me, you know, what, what happened on the walk? What, what did you hear? What did I said, Prabhupada, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was enough. Yeah, actually, you know, and, uh, and, and he said, what did he say? And I said, he said, don't come close. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, over the years, something as simple as don't come close has replayed itself in my head a zillion times. And each time, it means something a little bit different. You know, don't take the spiritual master for granted. Never minimize the spiritual master. Don't think that coming close physically is coming close. You know, etc., etc. These kinds of things, right? And this is the way... I, I think most devotees, you know, uh, we have a the facsimile of that in the material world where, um, you know, whether it's relationships between parents and children or men and women or events in your life or work or whatever, you know, that there's like this pivotal tiny little fragment of a moment that remains tagged by that experience or tagged to that experience and we carry that. So it's exactly the same way in Srila Prabhupada's, uh, um, w you know, we like to think that uh, they were intentional, but uh, really they're all part of a grand play that Krishna is orchestrating. So, you know, that particular um, experience was uh, kind of, set the tone for the rest of my experience with Srila Prabhupada, which was even when I would ask him a question, he would generally turn to Tamal or someone else and say, what is that? What is he asking? Like I, I couldn't even come close enough that I could ask Prabhupada a question and he would really get it, you know. And then they would, they would explain the question and Prabhupada would turn back to me and answer the question, you know. So my relationship with Srila Prabhupada was always... Uh, for the most part, it was through intermediaries. In the same year, 1974, the artists in Bali and I had thought for the reprinting of the Isopanishad, we would have a new picture on the cover. Instead of Lord Vishnu, we would have a picture of Krishna on the cover. So. Again, I had the good fortune to present that idea to Srila Prabhupada. He rejected it. He was angry. He said, I have specifically chosen Lord Vishnu to be on the cover of the Sri Isopanishad. I want this book to be attractive to people of all philosophical persuasions, even Mayavadis, Vedantists. All different philosophical schools, they have to see Vishnu on the cover of Isopanishad. Krishna, they won't buy it. What is wrong with you? Whose idea is this? Prabhupada was so involved in selecting the artwork, choosing the size, physically the size, the number of pages per book, the design of the book. Prabhupada's genius was that he was taking books of the highest philosophy 
and making them popular. Philosophy books aren't popular. Philosophy books don't sell anywhere in the world. But Prabhupada's genius was to have these gorgeous art paintings carefully chosen to insert in philosophy books to sell them to the average persons all over the world. This was genius marketing on Srila Prabhupada's part. And he was in charge. He planned this. You could not make a change if he didn't approve it. You know, in Chicago, Prabhupada said uh, from the Vyasa San, he told a story of uh, Vishwamitra Muni and how he had performed penances and austerities for 60,000 of years. And then, unfortunately, Prabhupada said he, he fell down in the association of uh, Menaka. So Prabhupada said then he gave birth to the Apsara. And then he again went back and again he performed 60,000 of years of penance and austerities. And then again he, his penance was given up. So Prabhupada said, so this is a very difficult process. He said, but for us, the results attained by Vishvamitra Muni by 60,000 of years, he always put an S on the end, 60,000 of years performing this tapasya and penance, Prabhupada said, the devotee achieves by the performance of Sankirtan. And he paused. He said, it was like, the devotee achieves by the performance of Sankirtan. And Prabhupada looked at him, in a few days only. And the temple room, literally, it felt like the roof was going to be blown off. 200 devotees, and the reaction to that statement was so instantaneous, okay, and so joyous. It was almost like someone saying, normally it would take a million dollars to get into this building or to get this car, but for the next 20 seconds, anyone in this room can have it for one dollar only, you know? <laughs> and everybody, what? They'd go crazy, right? So Prabhupada was saying, by performance of Sankirtan, in a few days only, right? And the devotees just, wow. And Prabhupada realized how much he had satisfied everyone. And he had this smile on his face that was just amazing. And uh, he was so happy to have made the devotees so happy. When Prabhupada arrived in Hawaii, he came down this this escalator that was isolated in the airport. It was strange. It was like right in the middle of a, of a very open space. And it just came straight down the middle. So it was almost like a stage entrance. And when Prabhupada came, all the devotees were chanting and doing kirtan and everything. And Prabhupada already had like six garlands on as he was coming down the steps. And when he got down further, when he stepped off, he had two or three more. And uh, it was beautiful, I mean, you know, this Hawaiian lays, you know. And then one lady walked up out of nowhere that we didn't know. One of the boys that w were there recognized her. But she stepped forward and she said, Swamiji, may I offer you a garland? And Srila Prabhupada looked at her and his smile was so, it was like a child. And he said, why, yes. And then... He, and she started to reach, and then Prabhupada said, wait. And he takes off one garland, puts it on a devotee, takes off another garland, puts it on a devotee, takes off another garland, puts it on a devotee. And then Prabhupada said, all right. And he leans forward like this. And as the woman puts the flower garlands on Prabhupada, she, she bows her head like this, right? And Prabhupada touched her. Just touched her head. I mean, you know, when you see somebody's eyes just burst, just burst into tears, right? And Prabhupada looked at him, he got a smile on his face, he said, that's all right, like that. And devotees were, you know, just beside themselves, chanting. A few weeks before Srila Prabhupada's visit to Los Angeles in 1976, I had come home, I would come home, I call it home, I had come back from India, and I had caught hepatitis and jaundice. I was as yellow as you can imagine and I was deathly ill. I could not get out of bed. 
And some of my GBC God brothers knew this at the time. And Kirtananda had connected me to, to a Indian doctor who was part of the congregation of New Vrindavan, who had prescribed a specific diet for me that was going to cure me of hepatitis. Srila Prabhupada heard that I was sick, and his secretary at the time was Pusta Krishna Maharaj. So he called and found out that I was on this diet. They wanted to know how I was because Prabhupada was getting ready to come here. And when Srila Prabhupada heard the diet that I was on, he called the doctor a bogus rascal, gave a new diet to Pusta Krishna Maharaj, had him call me immediately, and they put me on the diet, and within a week I was completely cured and ready for Srila Prabhupada's visit, which I thought was just astounding that Prabhupada has perfect knowledge of so many things. So when Prabhupada arrived here and stayed for a while in New Dwarka, one of our leading artists, Jadarani, had also gotten very, very sick. She had gotten so sick that she couldn't even feed herself. We had assigned a devotee to spoon feed her. She couldn't move, she couldn't walk. We didn't know what she had. She was in a wheelchair. Prabhupada heard this and he wanted to see her. Now, she had been seeing a doctor that a number of devotees in 1976 had been going to, a well-known iridologist, a doctor that prescribes by examining your eyes different conditions in your body. And he had given Jadarani all kinds of medications and diet instructions and so on. So Prabhupada asked to see her. So we carried her up the stairs to Prabhupada's quarters in her wheelchair. We carried her up. When we got to the top of the stairs, we helped her crawl out of her wheelchair. And literally, she had to crawl into the door of Prabhupada's sitting room and come all the way up to his desk. Prabhupada was getting massage at the time in the area, in his bedroom, close to the sitting room. And when Prabhupada saw Jadarani, he told her, come here. And we watched her crawl up to Srila Prabhupada. And when she got there, Srila Prabhupada put his hand on her forehead. But it was much more than just a parent touching a child's forehead to see if they have a fever. We were watching how intense this was that Prabhupada was holding her head as if it was an instrument that was measuring all the disease in her body. And he, he was so thoughtful and, 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 and quiet as he was holding her head, as if his hand was a medical instrument. And he was diagnosing her. And after a few moments, Srila Prabhupada looked at her and said, you will be all right. And this doctor you are seeing, this Dr. Benish down in Laguna Beach, he is a quack. So <laughs> Jadarani crawled back through the sitting room to her wheelchair. We carried her back into her wheelchair. We carried her down the stairs. And as we were carrying her down the street to her quarters, she was yelling at the top of her lungs, which she didn't have the strength to even whisper before, Dr. Benish is a quack. Dr. Benish is a quack. She was announcing it to the world. <laughs> Within three days, Jadarani was completely well. She was walking, talking. She went back to painting. She was eating herself. She had been cured. It was, it was exactly like a miracle health cure, right? So something out of the New Testament. That's exactly what happened. Srila Prabhupada had the ability to cure us on every level imaginable. I met a policeman in Port of Authority in uh, 19, well, I think it was 77. It was in 77. It was just a little bit after the Rathiatra. And um, 
the policeman uh, said that he had worked on the detail for the 76 Rathiatra. And he said, I knew that uh, your, your Swami, no, I think he actually said Guru, was special. And we, we said, why did you, why? And he said, because, you know, normally in New York, when there's like a celebrity of some kind or a politician or whatever, it's really difficult to hold the crowds back. And everybody's getting up there and, you know, we have to have a lot of cops and we have to push everybody back. And he said, but he got out of that car to get on your, on your parade. And he said, there had to be a thousand of you kids running around there. And then he got out of the car and just stood up and he didn't even seem to notice. And he just started walking towards the, the cart and uh, everybody just parted. Just stepped back. He said it was like Moses parting the Red Sea. And he said, and he never even appeared to notice that this could have been problematic. I sold Bhagavad Gita's to two soldiers, separate events, uh, in the airport as we were waiting for Srila Prabhupada to arrive for the Rathiatra uh, in San Francisco. And after he gave me $20 for Bhagavad Gita, I said, you know, the author to this book is arriving right now. And uh, if you like, I can take him. You can, you can greet him. We're all greeting him. Would you like to do that? And the guy said, of course, let's go. So we, we run over. We have to run quite a distance to get to the gate. And um, uh, as we're running, he's getting more and more and more excited. And he's seeing all these devotees running. Devotee women and saris, men. Devotees carrying redungas, you know. And he's getting more and more excited. And as he's walk, running along, he pulls out his wallet and he goes, here. He takes out another $50 and he gives it to me as we're running. He goes, I didn't give you enough. And I go, okay. And I take it, you know. And we rush up. And just as we get to the gate, it's almost time for Srila Prabhupada to come through. So he's, he's looking over everybody. He's trying to see. And then he jumps up on one of the chairs. And he looks down over everybody's head. And he can look right where Prabhupada's coming through the gate. And he sees Prabhupada's head. He sees the top of Prabhupada's head. And uh, he goes crazy. And he starts yelling, there he is, I see him, I see his head, I see his head. Now how does that happen, right? I see him, I see, I, I see him, I see his head. So Prabhupada comes out, the devotees are all there, and the guy looks at me, and he says, well, what should I do? And I said, just do what everybody's doing, offer obeisances. So he jumps down on the floor and his hat falls off and somebody kicks it. <laughs> and he pays no attention. He bows down his head. And then I rush over and I grab his hat because I didn't want to get the step on. I grab his hat and I bring it back to him. And he is like a child. He's, you know, he's a soldier in uniform, carrying a big green rucksack. And he sees Srila Prabhupada and he gets swept up in this intoxication of momentary association with Srila Prabhupada. And, uh, and after Prabhupada walked by us and went out, you know, into the car, he was beside him and said, did you see that? Did you see what happened? Did you see? That was incredible. That was amazing. Totally excited. Two years later, Washington, D.C., I do the same thing. Meet a boy half hour before Prabhupada arrives. I'm in the airport distributing books and I give him a bug beat and I tell him, hey, you know, the author of this book is arriving. How would you like to greet him? Right? And he goes, are you serious? And I go, yeah. And he goes, where? And I go, come on, let's go. We rush over to the TWA wing of the airport. And by this time, all the devotees had kind of set up a lot, two lines, right, for Prabhupada to come through and they had thrown flowers and the airport was a little upset because they had made a little bit of a mess with the flowers, but you know, devotees. So anyway, Prabhupada comes through the finger, this big cavernous, okay, and the TWA building in the D.C. airport was quite cavernous too, so the kirtan was really loud and resonant. And Prabhupada's walking, and he just looks, you know, and you got this kind of bright light behind Prabhupada, and it's almost like Prabhupada was like a shadow, you know, the, 
there was about four people or five people in that party walking through the finger. The problem is, you know, come in. And I, I point him out. I said, there he is. There he is. He's right there. You see him? And I, I turned the book over. I see, see his picture. I said, there he is. He's right there. And the guy's going, oh, my God. And he's holding on my arm, okay? And he's like, oh, my God, you're right. That's it. That's him. That's him. He's there. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and then Prabhupada comes through, and he takes the Bhagavad Gita, and he holds it up like this. And he goes, sir. He's trying to get Prabhupada's attention. He goes, sir, sir, sir. And Prabhupada stops right in front of him. He goes, I got your book. And Prabhupada looks at him and he says, thank you very much. And then he turns and he walks. And the guy looks at him and he, again, you know, he goes, can you believe that? He talked to me. Did you see that? He, he talked to me, you know? And I'm like, yeah, you, you can't believe what just happened to you. You have no idea what just happened to you. In January of 1977, I was traveling with Srila Prabhupada as his personal secretary. And we had a lot of time opportunities to have intimate conversations, especially when we were traveling by train to the Kumbh Mela and so on. So on one particular conversation, we were talking about the topic of nuclear war. Prabhupada had spoken about this over the last two years, predicting that America and Russia would start a nuclear war through their proxy states, India and Pakistan. And this had been a topic of, of great concern and, and Qatar all over ISKCON for some years. So I wanted to, I did ask Srila Prabhupada, was there any chance of this war being averted? And at first he said no. He said communism is so evil, we must force this war to happen. Communism has to end. In fact, Srila Prabhupada said, just as Krishna appears to protect the devotees and annihilate the demons, so this Hare Krishna movement has arisen to annihilate the two great demons of our age, godless communism and godless science. So there must be a war to end it. And then Prabhupada sat back and thought, we were, we were on a train at the time of this conversation. We were sharing a car. And then Prabhupada said, but there is a possibility that this war may be averted. It depends on your book distribution. So I'm a fanatic for book distribution, any kata of any sort from Prabhupada, so I'm now hanging on every word on the edge of my seat. And Prabhupada said, your book distribution is creating a spiritual environment throughout the whole world. And that will awaken spiritual sentiments in everyone's heart. And as that awakens, as you continue this book distribution, that spiritual sentiment may bring down communism from within. And then Prabhupada said, yes, and future historians will note this, how communism failed because of your book distribution. They will note this, future historians, how a revolution, a spiritual revolution throughout human society took place. Srila Prabhupada, he just was so confident. And so uh, I was on a walk when one Indian gentleman was talking about Gandhi. And he said he was glorifying Gandhi's peace movement, right? And Prabhupada said, Gandhi's peace movement was nonsense. No, it was nonsense. And the man was shocked. And Prabhupada said, uh, that you cannot put an end to war in this material world. War is a feature of this material world. Everyone is here competing to be Krishna. So where is the question of peace? No, you cannot have peace here. So uh, when he said it, it was with such, like, uh, it's like a thud, like dropping an anvil, you know, on somebody, like, boom. And it doesn't even bounce. It just goes, boom, 
like that. In 1976, I had been flying with Srila Prabhupada to different cities, and we were sitting in the airport past the security, so it was just a, myself and Prabhupada's servant and secretary. We were talking about war in the Kali Yuga and whether or not these happen by chance, like a, like a fire in a forest, or whether or not they're deliberate, caused by a small group that controls governments and oligarchs and so on. And as usual, Prabhupada had amazing, ingenious insight into every topic. So he started off by telling us, yes, take for example, your Vietnam War. Your president from Texas, uh, Johnson, uh, a state where they kill cattle, a great meat eater. So whatever he tried to do to end that war, because of his sinful activities, he simply became more and more entangled in the war. And it kept going on and on. And then Prabhupada said, but actually they wanted that war to go on and on. Because after Johnson at Nixon, Prabhupada said, they were afraid of the American youth, hippies, drug hippies in revolution against society, blacks in revolution against society. And they thought, let this war go on and we will draft these hippies and we will draft these black activists and let them all be killed off in this war. That's what Prabhupada told us. Another time I was going to walk with Srila Prabhupada when he actually, uh, he stopped. The moon was in the sky, the sun was in the sky. Prabhupada stopped and he looked and so, and he put his hands on his cane like this two hands on the top of the cane. He said, so it is my conclusion that the moon is cool flame. And he looks around at everybody. And he said, yes, it must be flame. Otherwise, where, come, where from comes the illumination? And he said, but it must be cool flame. And this is the most amazing part of this. He said, it must be cool flame. Otherwise, why wouldn't our Tamananda have sung Koti Chandra Shushitala, that Lord Nityananda's lotus feet are more soothing and cooling than a thousand moons. <laughs> so he's operating from the position that he's using his reasoning, his logic. The syllogism starts with Nartam Ananda, Nartam Das Ananda has sung and affirmed that Lord Nityananda's lotus feet are more soothing than thousands of moons. That's the first term in his logical <laughs> establishment. That's pretty amazing. And he said it as if it was just simply an axiomatic fact. So um, that kicked off a whole discussion about the moon and things that he had said about the moon and written about the moon and so on, right? And he became very, very playful with the devotees. Uh, he, he would, so you've been to the moon? You've been lately? Yeah. How about you, Jayadway de Mars? You've been? No, Srila Prabhupada. Huh? You, you've been? No. So how do you know? What do you know of the moon? You only know what they tell you. So this is our point. We accept Krishna's verdict on everything. They can accept whatever. We accept Krishna's verdict. So Prabhupada was just using the subject matter, to poke holes in our faith in the material scientists and so on, you know, and uh, show us that really they don't know. They say they know this or that, but if they've not gone, they don't know. They're just accepting what somebody else has said. So this was a very important point, and at our tender age at that time, we didn't really understand it. If you think back, we didn't discuss things like the ontology of Krishna consciousness, you know? And uh, it was explained to us in a very direct and straightforward manner by Srila Prabhupada that 
The only way you can know the absolute truth is if you accept the Vedic version. Otherwise, you can't know anything, one way or the other. So the only way you can know is have faith in the Vedas and, and then apply that and have that revealed. Srila Prabhupada said, and after communism is defeated, we must attack and defeat godless science, the demons of godless science, Darwin. We must attack. We must defeat. And we were traveling on the train, Prabhupada looked out the window and said, there is so much illiteracy in India right now, and that is Krishna's blessing. I said, why? Prabhupada said, so they don't have to hear the nonsense, atheistic philosophies of Darwin. Srila Prabhupada, last instruction to me as a BVT trustee was to publish books that defeat godless science and sell them to the temples at cost. They were going to be exempt from the 50% markup that every other book had. He carved out an exception for the science books. And he ordered me to take money from the BBT as a budget for the science preaching. 10, 20,000 a month, whatever, it, whatever they need. That's how much Srila Prabhupada was determined that through the BBT we were going to defeat godless science. I remember in Chicago, one couple was introduced to Prabhupada and he asked the husband, so you're reading our books? It was in a darshan. He said, so you're reading our books? And uh, he said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, I've completed the Bhagavad Gita, I read the teachings of Lord Chaitanya, and I'm now reading the Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada said, oh, that's very good. And the wife was sitting to the side and a little behind him, and Prabhupada looked at her for a second, and he said, so you, you are also reading? And she went, well, Srila Prabhupada, actually, I love the chanting, but I don't really like the philosophy so much. And Prabhupada said, that's all right. And then she went, oh, but I do read the Krishna book. And Prabhupada said, oh, that's perfect. Everything is there. And then he waited a second, he said, I also read Krishna book. And the whole room just, you know, just got ecstatic when Prabhupada said that and also looked at the woman with a sort of uh, encouragement, you know? Like everyone was looking, you know, hey, that's fantastic, you know? And she looked around for like everyone's kind of, you know, reaction like that. But the Prabhupada was so kind, he just, he said, uh, anyway, that's all right. And then when she said, oh, I do like the, the Krishna book, Prabhupada said, well, I read it too. Srila Prabhupada was a genius in everything, in every sphere of life. When Prabhupada created the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust in 1972, his vision was, you print a book, let's say it costs a dollar, you sell it to the temple for two dollars. When the two dollars come in, one dollar goes into the book fund, one dollar goes into the temple construction fund, 50-50. That was his vision, that was his plan. So starting in 1973, Srila Prabhupada started giving out loans to temples from the temple fund. And the genius of this is that as the loan payments came back in, that money paid for the entire BBT overhead. The temples were repaying loans with interest. And that money was not part of the formula. In 1973, if a book cost a dollar, you still sold it for two dollars. But meanwhile, the loans you had made in 1972 were starting to come back in in 1973. That money covered the entire BBT overhead. So that's how we were able to stick to this brilliant formula of 50-50. Vrindavan in 1975 or 76, um, we were walking down the road 
there were some events that led up to this, but um, we're walking down the road and Prabhupada looks and sees a pig get out of the water and run off. And Prabhupada started laughing. And he said, in New York, uh, you have seen that library on, I think, 42nd Street, New York Public Library, very big. Prabhupada said, so many books, thousands and thousands of books, Prabhupada said, all about sex. It's kind of funny how Prabhupada would sometimes exaggerate things for effect. And it was brilliant comedy, in a sense. You know, thousands and thousands of books, all about sex, how to make sex, how to study sex, the psychology of sex, how to have better sex. Prabhupada said, Dr. Freud, philosophy. Prabhupada said, but this hog, he has not read any books, but he can have sex with his mother, with his daughter, with his sister. Oh, yes, he can do. And Prabhupada said, that he can make sex better than you. And he has not read any book. So if you want, if you want uh, good sex, then you come back as a hog. And he, you know, it was just like a moment of just punching, you know. Another time he was walking down the, the road at Vrindavan, and uh, he saw camel off in the distance chewing on thorny trees, just like we read about in the Bhagavatam. And Srila Prabhupada looked up and prior to that he had been very kind of growly. He was disturbed by some of the things that he considered to have not been yet managed correctly in the build up to the opening of the Vrindavan temple. So he was pointing these things out, you know, to the different people like uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj and Dayananda and so on. So I won't go into the details of that, but um, he was kind of growly and then he looked up and saw these camel and immediately he started chuckling. He said, <laughs> just see, just like our Grihastas. And Sri Govinda Prabhu was walking next to Prabhupada and he said, he said, Srila Prabhupada, remember how Sri Govinda used to wear that white cheddar over his head and just this kind of beak would kind of point out, you know, he's like, had an unusual appearance. And uh, he said, don't you mean the Griya Medes, Srila Prabhupada? And Prabhupada looked and he's walking with his cane. He goes, you are talking Griya Medes. I am talking Grihastas. <laughs> so then he stops and he says, uh, isn't it so much difficulty, so much labor, like the camel? He chews the thorns, he's eating his own blood. Prabhupada said, there's so much labor, so much effort, so much work uh, to have a child. And the wife has to suffer so much. Then labor, then the child comes, so much pain. And then Prabhupada said, and then the man, he has to work so hard. 20 year sentence. And then Prabhupada says, and one year later, the wife says, I want another. And Prabhupada says, this is Maya. And then from that, a whole conversation ensued about, you know, well, some men have to get married. I don't know why you say that all the women should be married, Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, yes, that is best. But then some men are going to have to marry. And Prabhupada said, yes. And then he turned and he stopped and he looked right at Sri Govinda and he put his finger up and he said, but when you marry, you must understand you are doing so under the influence of the modes of material nature. with the idea of being that it's passion, not compassion, that brings us to this point. And uh, then he said, you understand? And Sri Govinda said, he stared right at Prabhupada, like terrified, you know. And he said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. And then Prabhupada turned and he walked. And as we walked by the camel, Prabhupada just laughed. <laughs> he just chuckled. So, you know, it was, uh, it was almost like the Bhagavatam coming to life, you know. The verse is in the Bhagavatam. It was 1976 and Srila Prabhupada was coming to visit New Dwarka for the last time. And every morning we would drive Prabhupada to his morning walk, either at Venice Beach or Santa Monica. This particular morning, Tamal Krishna Maharaj and myself and Prabhupada's servant 
were driving Srila Prabhupada to his morning walk in Santa Monica. And in the car, it was typical that we would a either ask philosophical questions or we would talk about something in the world news of current events that we found um, controversial or exciting and, and, and have Prabhupada comment on it. So this particular morning, a news story had broken the day before that was to us somewhat astonishing. There was a group of demented artists in New York that had captured headlines all over the world by having a party in which they served and ate the flesh of aborted fetuses. This artist, uh, le the leader of this group was Andy Warhol and he was famous for sensational shock. And so we started to tell Srila Prabhupada this story. And I expected Prabhupada, I thought Prabhupada was going to comment on the demonic nature of the living entity and the horror of, 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 of slaughtering anyone for food. But instead, as we told Prabhupada this story, he sat, leaned back on it, the, the back seat of the car and he said, yes, they have not yet learned in this Kali Yuga that human flesh is the tastiest of all meats. That will come in the future of Kali Yuga. So Tamal and I were astonished <laughs> Prabhupada's response to this story. It was not what we were expecting. And in that instant of realization that, my God, Prabhupada knows everything. He knows what the future of Kali Yuga is. How does he know what meat tastes like? What to speak of which meat is the tastiest? Is human flesh? I, I mean, it, our minds were literally, I guess you could say, blown. <laughs> By it. We were just in, amazed that Prabhupada knows everything. And I blurted out, Srila Prabhupada, you know everything about everything. You see the future, you, you, you comment on things that are current, but also talk about the future. And I said, this is what makes your book so unique. Previous great acharyas have written commentaries on Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, but yours not only perfect for the time that we're living in, but they're perfect for the future because you, you, you have the ability to see the future and you comment on it in your purports. And it's just amazing to me how unique your books are and special they are. And Srila Prabhupada smiled and said, yes, my books will be the law books for humanity for the next 10,000 years. That is how I think as I write each word. Primarily, whenever we got a chance to be with Srila Prabhupada, we were introduced to him, not just myself as an individual, but uh, groups of men, as his Sankirtan devotees. And he always, generally speaking, would express something like, thank you very much. And my Guru Maharaj thanks you very much. You know why he said that? It's not only do I thank you, but my Guru Maharaj thanks you very much. And he also said in a why, he said, if you dedicate your whole life to distributing these books, then I promise you, you will go back to home, back to God. He would say this. And um, it was very... It was uh, like a loving father telling us, giving us a secret. You know, like, this is like a secret. You know, just do this. And, and um, uh, he would always, um, temple to temple, wherever I saw him in the temples that he would go, he would always say something along the lines of, this is like, I see this is, I've been to many temples, but this temple, I think this is the best, you know. Wherever he went, he would say something along those lines, and he really knew how to reach into devotees' hearts and sort of t 
take possession of their heart. When he went to the Baltimore Temple, for example, from D.C., he did it in such a dramatic fashion. He was in, the, in his room in Washington, and someone brought in a picture of the deities from Baltimore. And Prabhupada looked at the and he said, where are these deities? And they said, they're in Baltimore, Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, Baltimore? Baltimore is not far from here. And he said, and they said, no, Prabhupada, it's about an hour away at the most. And Prabhupada said, prepare the car, we'll go immediately. And just pushed, pushed the table in front of him, stood up and like, let's go. And the whole temple, the, every devotee that was in Washington got in their own cars and vans and everything and streamlined up to Baltimore and they drove a little slower so that everybody could get there before Prabhupada so that when Prabhupada got there, the 150 devotees that were in D.C. were now in Baltimore, greeting Prabhupada in Baltimore. And then Prabhupada came in and he offered obeisances to the Gorni Thai deities there and the kirtan was going and Prabhupada was dancing in front of the deities with his arms raised and then he went and he sat down on the Vyasan. Kirtan went for a little while. And then Prabhupada began by saying, so you were all very, very fortunate here in Baltimore. He said, this is a very, very beautiful temple. And he said, uh, you're very fortunate here that you simply come every day before their lordships uh, and you chant Jai Nitai Gora, Jai Sachinandana, and you will all go back to home, back to God. <laughs> Very simple, right? And of course, a hundred devotees. Remember that Baltimore temple, how small it was? The room was no bigger than this, practically. And a hundred devotees were squeezed in there as if that was their temple. And uh, when Prabhupada said that, everyone just, their hearts burst open and they all cried out, Jai Prabhupada. And uh, that was the other element that was always there was the Devotees were always saturated with a sense of gratitude to Prabhupada and to Krishna for letting them be in that moment, letting them be there when that happened, whatever it was. Like when Prabhupada went into ecstasy in 75 in Mayapur and he actually, he was speaking, I can't remember the whole class, but at one point he said, you are all, uh, you should pray to Krishna a long life. You are all young men. And he had his eyes closed. And he said, not like me, I'm old. And when he said that, he was stunned. What happened, no one can know. But he said that, and Krishna said, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm sure that something like that happened. And uh, Prabhupada was totally internal. Were you there when that happened? Yeah, and, and the temple room, no one could breathe, right? No one could breathe. Everyone's just like... And then Prabhupada finally, uh, Trivikram Swami, went, Jai Srila Prabhupada. It had to be like two, three minutes. And he went, Jai Srila Prabhupada, very softly. And then another 60 seconds later, Prabhupada kind of moved a little bit, and Hansa Duda started singing... Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya. And Prabhupada eventually, he moved his head like this and then he reached down and without opening his eyes, he grabbed his cartels. Kind of moved his hand, grabbed his cartels and then, and then opened his eyes and started singing. And everybody that was in that moment, everyone experienced that, realized that they had actually experienced something extraordinary. And for the rest of the day, you could go anywhere in Mayapur and everybody was thinking about that and talking about it and did you see that happen? Oh my God, it was amazing, you know. The Prophet was uh, making everyone feel very fortunate, you know, to have those opportunities and those moments. Sometime in 1971, Srila Prabhupada had told Karandar that his vision for New Dwarka went way beyond just the building the <clears throat> that we had bought for the world headquarters, he wanted us to buy the residential buildings and start buying up the block. And he told Karandar, you buy the first building, then 
you go to a bank and borrow. You take out a mortgage on the first building. Use that money to buy the second building. That second building doesn't have a mortgage because you just bought it with the other money. So now you take out a mortgage on the second building and you use that to buy the third building. And in this way, you buy up the block. And Prabhupada told Karanda, this is called frying the fish in its own oil. <laughs> and that's how we bought all these buildings that make up the New Dwarka community. Between 1972 and 1975, we had bought six or seven buildings. Prabhupada was a genius. In Chicago, um, Prabhupada was giving an example in a walk that how the materialistic society um, is determined to essentially take everything that Krishna has given them in this material world, the material energy, and instead of using it for service to Krishna and therefore for the good of themselves and everyone else, they're using it ultimately trying to steal it and keep it for themselves and therefore they're misusing it like a knife. It can be used to cut vegetables or it can be used to cut your throat. And so I said, well, Srila Prabhupada, if we were more pure, could we convince them to stop cutting? Would, it be be would we be better at convincing them to stop cutting their throat? And Srila Prabhupada said, no, what you're preaching is perfect and pure. He said, they're all envious. They're like snakes, very envious like serpents. He said, but you know what is a snake charmer? Have you seen the snake charmer? And uh, he said, so you have to become like that. You have to learn how to charm them, to bring them back to Krishna. So I always took that as a kind of general instruction, but also a direct instruction to me. In Washington, I did tell Prabhupada a lot about the events of Sankirtan that day and in general. I told Srila Prabhupada that uh, one soldier had um, told me that he and a group of his men in Fort Jackson, South Carolina used to meet regularly and read his Bhagavad Gita together. And that, that boy I met just that day that I was with Prabhupada that night. It's so, you know, unusual. And um, I met another soldier that day who gave me, I gave him four books and he gave me $80. When I told Srila Prabhupada that I gave one boy four books and he gave me $80, Prabhupada looked at me and his eyes got big and he went, four books, $80? That is a handsome profit. <laughs> And uh, when I told him about the boy in um, Fort Jackson, Prabhupada was surprised. And I said, and they regularly meet together, Srila Prabhupada, read the Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada went, Acha, our Bhagavad Gita? Like, you know, and I said, your Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> and then Prabhupada looks at me and he goes, just see, just see, like, it started, you know, the, uh, the encroachment of Krishna is progressing. Watching the loans that Srila Prabhupada made gives you an idea of how this movement grew in many ways. In 1973, about $250,000 was loaned out to temples. In 1974, it was just under $500,000 that was loaned out to temples. In 1975, it was a little over $1 million that was loaned out to temples. Are you seeing the pattern of book distribution doubling every year? In 19, it, at the end of 1975, we had just finished the Chaitanya Charitamrita 17-book marathon. Now we knew we could do anything. There is no such thing as impossible. So at the end of 1975, we get a letter from Srila Prabhupada that they have finally gotten permission to build the beautiful Bombay Temple, Hotel, Theater, and Cultural Center in Juhu Beach. And Prabhupada wrote in the letter, we have just signed a contract with a major construction managing company. As a result, 
I will need you, in addition to the loans you're making, in addition to the books you're printing, to send to Bombay every month 70,000 US dollars in order to fulfill this contract and build the Bombay Temple. So in 1976, the loans plus the Bombay money totaled almost $2 million. Again, it doubled. And when the Bombay Temple had its grand opening in 1977, that's 35 years ago, um, LA became the sister city, the sister temple to Bombay as a result. And thereafter, 1977, that same 70 or $80,000 a month that we were sending continued to Brindavan and mainly to Mayapur. And as long as we could hold, uh, afford it, we kept sending that much money to the India projects from the book distributors. He also told me in Washington when uh, I was introduced to him, Hari Sari said, uh, Prabhupada Pragosh was trying to learn how to sell your books like full sets, like an encyclopedia. And he recently worked with one company and Prabhupada looked, he was listening to him and and uh, well, he's actually over there and he's looking over here and he, he went, so how did that go? And I said, well, Srila Prabhupada, Tamal Krishna Maharaj and I had attempted this, but it was pretty clear that it, the BBT didn't have all the full sets in stock like this. And also, it, it, generally speaking, the, the uh, you know, the common man is not going to be able to buy this many books at one time. And uh, so then he said, so what are you doing now? And I said, well, I went right back to the airport, Srila Prabhupada, and I'm doing books in the airports like I was for the last few years. And Prabhupada looked at me for a second, and he, and he kind of smiled and said, yes, whatever increases book distribution, we accept. Whatever decreases it, we reject. Just like that, he took his hand. And went, we reject. So it was a simple statement, and I took it as a sort of a very specific instruction, which I look back on my life and I realize I've made many decisions that really didn't increase my book distribution, you know. <laughs> and then you go back. Another thing that Prabhupada said in that, in that particular time was he asked about prasadam distribution in New York. And um, he said, so they're selling prasadam in New York City on the street? And I said, uh, yes, Srila Prabhupada. He said, he said what, are they, what are they selling? And I said, I don't know, Srila Prabhupada. I'm not sure. And he, then he looks at me and he goes, kachoris? They're selling kachoris? And his eyes got big. And I said, um, I don't know, Srila Prabhupada, if they're selling kachoris. And Prabhupada said, oh, they must. They must. First class kachoris, cooked in ghee. Then everyone will, th then the meat eaters will lose their taste for meat, naturally. It was a sort of a, you know, we all heard about, heard about Srila Prabhupada as kachori mukha as a child, liking kachoris, and that was the only thing he asked about. When I said that they were selling for Sodom, he said, kachoris? They must, well, they must, you know. It was, Childlike. Then he asked me, are you coming to Rathiatra? He, no, first he said, are you, do you stay here in Washington? I said, no, Srila Prabhupada, I, I'm living in New York. And then he said, oh, I began in New York. Again, very childlike, you know. And uh, he said, so you're coming to Rathiatra? And I said, I wouldn't miss it for anything, Srila Prabhupada. And he said, yes, Rathiatra in New York City it has always been my dream. He said, he said, America is the most important country in the world, and New York, the most important city in America. And Fifth Avenue is the most important street in New York. Just like that. And uh, it was just a very warm and friendly kind of revelation, you know. He was just basically talking about some, himself as a person, as a child. It was very personal. Srila Prabhupada came for a long visit in New Dwarka in, starting in March of 1973. We had just had the first book distribution Christmas marathon in 72. 
So this was a very exciting time. And I was a Sankirtan leader at the time, so when Prabhupada was here, every day I would compile a report of all the scores for each book distributor, devotee by devotee, how many books they distributed. And at night I would bring them that report over to Prabhupada's quarters. I'd wait at the bottom of the stairs, and either Brahmananda or Shruti Kirti would come down around 9.30 to collect it from me. And they were going to read it to Prabhupada, either that night or the next day during his massage. And I would go back every day at around 11 in the morning to meet them at the stairs and find out what happened. What did Prabhupada say? Because we lived for any instruction, any word, any encouragement. We, we saw Srila Prabhupada as giving his whole life to writing these books. And we saw ourselves as giving our whole lives to distributing these books. So there was this phenomenal relationship going on with the Sankirtan devotees and Prabhupada at that time. One day Shruti Kirti came down and told me that they had read it to Prabhupada the night before. And as he was lying in his bed, he was rolling from side to side in ecstasy, exhibiting ecstatic symptoms. And he uttered the words, we will smash all these bogus incarnations. So this was going on for weeks. And finally, on March 20th, 1973, after massage, Prabhupada said, give me that report. And he went over to his desk and he hand wrote a note to the Sankirtan devotees and gave it back to them to give to me. My dear boys and girls, you are all working so hard to broadcast the glories of Lord Krishna's lotus feet. And because of that, you have pleased my Guru Maharaj so much that he will bestow his mercy upon you thousand times more than me. And that is my satisfaction. Your ever well wisher A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. And then he wrote N.B., note below, everyone must join the Sankirtan party as soon as possible. We have that note in Prabhupada's handwriting. So when I told Srila Prabhupada that uh, this soldier had um, given me $80 and took four books, he had also asked me, could he be Krishna conscious and still be a soldier? And Srila Prabhupada looked at me and he said, so how did you answer? And I said, I told him, Srila Prabhupada, that the Bhagavad Gita was spoken to the greatest warrior in human history which it was kind of a, Prabhupada was charmed by that because he looked over at Hari Sari like, this guy really knows how to lay it on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then he looks back at me and uh, he waits for a second. He takes turns, he takes a couple steps and then he looks back at me and he goes, you have answered rightly. Arjuna was a military man, just like that. He was just enlivened by, you know, the, the, the simple frankness of it. And uh, he confirmed it. We were in Chicago. Somebody said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, they're, uh, they're, sometimes they're taking the books, they're tearing them up, they're throwing them in the trash. His immediate retort. He stops, he turns, he says, they're throwing their babies in the trash. What can be done? What can be done? We cannot prevent that. Prabhupada said, but even they touch the book before they throw it in the trash, they make some benefit. Immediately we're like, well, there's no problem there, you know. If we would get attacked by anybody physically, nobody was, we literally thought, you're trespassing. We own the airport <laughs> and we're letting you use it. You understand? Now that's, of course, to anyone in material consciousness, they would think that's outrageous or very cultish or whatever, you know. But quite literally, that was our inner sense of what was happening. We would go into malls. The first airports I distributed 
besides when I worked with Trip Ride a little bit in LA and I did Chicago for a little while. Then I went up to Minnesota. But the first airport I worked was actually Hawaii and it was illegal. So for four months, I worked that airport every day and I used to run from the cops, dodge the security cops. They were actually Hawaii cops. So one day, the cop arrested me and took me in the office. And he threw me up against the wall. He was very, very uh, thuggish. Not too professional. Big guy. So he pushes me up against the wall and uh, he grabs my shirt and he goes, now listen, I'm not going to tell you again. Don't come back here. Don't come back. I'll have you arrested. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not going to tell you again. I'm coming back every day. And he looked at me and he was completely flummoxed. He said, do you want me to arrest you? I said, you can arrest me. I'm single. He said, you're single? I said, I'm single. I don't have a wife. I don't have any kids. You can arrest me. I can sit in jail for a few days. No big deal. And he started laughing. He said, you don't, you don't care. I said, no, I don't care at all. I said, but as soon as I get out, I'm going to come back here. <laughs> I said, I give out 40, 50 of these books every day mostly to service guys. They need these books. They need these books. These books are very important. So then the guy lets go of me, he backs up, and uh, I start preaching to him. And I, in my mind, I just pray to Prophet. I said, Prophet, give me the right thing to say. I said, you know, you follow me around so much, you kind of catch me all the time. I said, you're thinking about me all the time. And then he, he's like, he's like in Paris, right? I said, I think you should read one of these books. I think that's why you're following me. Krishna wants you to follow me. I said, take this book home, read it. If you really feel that there's nothing of value in this book, then okay. But I said, I think you'll find something of value. So the next day, I had one of the devotee women make me a cheesecake at the temple. And I took it to the airport. And I hunted for him. And I didn't wait for him to catch me. I, I hunted for him. And uh, gave him the cheesecake. And he looked at me and said, all right, OK, all right. I read your book, a little bit of your book. And I read enough. You're OK. He said, but I got a boss. And he's going to get on my case if I don't get on your case. So he said, so you do me a favor. When you see me walking, you sit down. Don't talk to people. Let me walk through, walk away, go in the other airport, other wing. And then you go back to what you're doing. Is that OK? I said, we got a deal. And I shook his hand. And we had that kind of authority. We felt that we had this authority because Prabhupada was absolutely cracking the whip. He was cracking the whip in the most loving, wonderful way. That we, 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 we were, it was impossible to say no to Prabhupada. Because he was literally like the king and the general. The book distributors especially, we saw him in that generalship, kingly way, probably more so than maybe others, because that was the relationship that we had. And in Chicago, there were so many different situations where we got arrested in Chicago, we got arrested in Denver, we got arrested in, in uh, Hawaii, both on book distribution and Harinam. Uh, in New York, we, we used to get chased constantly by the cops in LaGuardia Airport until finally we kind of struck a deal with them. They gave us an area to work. And I used to bring the cop uh, every Friday, I used to bring him a cheesecake. And when I failed to bring him a cheesecake, he would come out and look for me. And he would get upset. He would say, hey, where's my cheesecake? 
<laughs> and I know because I met devotees from when I went to Mayapur in 75 and 76, I met devotees, men, brahmacharis from Australia, from England, from Germany, from Sweden, and uh, from other places, but oh, France. And they were all cut out of the same wood. And they all had stories of, you know, how hard they were pushing to distribute those books. Truthfully, we were pushing much more than we pushed since. And uh, we didn't care. And a lot of devotees will look back now and say, that was wrong to do, or that really yielded the wrong result, or didn't make any friends, or whatever, right? But the fact of the matter is, if you look at this country today, we need to start pushing again. We need to start making waves, getting some feedback. The way Bud and I pass out books at Rockefeller, that's one thing. That's, we're gifting people the books, and there's not going to be anything negative. But imagine if we had a thousand men in America again ready to be brahmachari for five years and ready to go into every possible situation and distribute Bhagavad Gita. And we have 40 years of experience now uh, translating for people this message that Prabhupada gave us, which is simultaneously beautiful, uh, all-knowing, thrilling, uh, attractive and problematic or problem solving it's everything right and we have much more knowledge of this now than we had then but the thing was at that particular time Srila Prabhupada was um, he made it clear when he came to Chicago and a reporter walked up to the window and stuck the the uh, microphone in his face and said, Swamiji, why have you come to Chicago? Without skipping a beat, Prabhupada picked up the Time magazine on the cover and said, crime, why and what to do? And Prabhupada picked up the magazine and said, why? Because you have a very big problem here in Chicago. Too much crime. I've, here it says crime, why and what to do. I have come to show you why and what to do. <laughs> and all the devotees were around the car. They, they just like, it was, Prabhupada was, he was not, uh, he, Prabhupada was not like any other guru, sadhu, all the people that are out there today talking about, but Prabhupada was, it was like he was, he was showing up with guns blazing. Guns blazing. He put everybody on the hot seat and we loved it, you know? He was like uh, Muhammad Ali. For the next 20 years, I'll whip any man from any country, any time, any place. That's what Prabhupada was like. He was like, I'm from, I'm from Goloka. I'm not from here. I'll take you all on, one at a time or all together at the same time. Let's go. You know? And all the devotees had that same, we, we, we got that from Prabhupada. As a matter of fact, uh, Prabhupada formed the BBT in 72. The largest number of devotees to join the movement joined from the time the BBT was started till Prabhupada left the planet. I mean, there might have been a thousand devotees up till then, and then suddenly, and most of us, myself included, or m myself more than anyone, have no earthly idea how I went from where I was to how I became a devotee in the space of uh, three months. I have no earthly idea how that happened. But I, had, I was a passionate athlete, smart enough and, and articulate enough that I could be a book distributor, but I have no idea how Krishna, but they, Krishna looked over and he said, this guy, he's got all this energy. It will be completely squandered in the material world. Totally wasted. 
My pure devotee is over here, and he's got a serious task to do. So here's one of a thousand. I'm going to grab by the hair, pull them right out of their material world, whatever it is. So many book distributors were musicians, athletes, right? Or losers from the material perspective, right? And then suddenly, just dragged by Krishna in and said, here, my pure devotee wants so desperately to accomplish all of this. Now you get the, you get the mercy here. You get the credit, you get the mercy, you get the fun, you get the joy, you get the excitement. It was exciting going on Sankirtan during that period, more than it's ever, ever been since. You never knew what was going to happen. You never knew. It was always going to be someone would respond in an amazing way to the book itself. Someone would respond in a negative way. And then eventually later they'd get turned and become your friend. It was amazing. Miraculous things would happen. Miraculous. And uh, we got to witness it. So how it happened? We have no idea. And, we're, and actually, every book distributor that I know that went through that period of that, that 10, 12 year period intensely, uh, they're, they're all like um, uh, veterans who are not damaged by the war. They're actually looking forward to the next war. <laughs> you know, they would love to be engaged like that. So, you know, Prabhupada, he injected something very special. And he said in Washington, when Mother Mina said, Prabhupada, it seems so strange that you tell us women should be so chaste and shy and quiet and, and submissive. And Prabhupada, yes. What is the difficulty? And she said, well, that's not my question. My question is, you also send us out every day on Sankirtan. And we have to stop men in the street. We have to smile at them, and we have to speak nicely to them, and we have to talk to them, and then we convince them to give us money. I said, yes, what is the difficulty? And she said, well, it seems, you know, one is at odds with the other. And Prabhupada, and, and Prabhupada looked at her and he said, oh, she said, it seems that you're asking us in some situations to be aggressive when, when we're not really supposed to be aggressive. And Prabhupada said, he looks at her and he goes, I am also an aggressor. I came to this country. I was aggressive. I was very aggressive. You also can be aggressive. But then Prabhupada said, well, you must learn how to be a lion on the chase and a lamb at home. So Prabhupada said, when you get home, then you can be the Madhaji. He said, is that all right? And she's smiling from ear to ear. She knows how... This is ecstatic. I can go out every day and be an aggressor and stop people and, hey, you're not your body. Guess where you come from? Guess what? You're, you're actually a rich man. You're a wealthy man. You just don't know it. You come from a very wealthy family. Take a look. And then come back to the temple and be just simple devotee. So Prabhupada was the... the uh, powerhouse behind all of that. He was the powerhouse and sometimes it was quietly injected and sometimes it was really powerfully injected and everyone felt it, you know. <laughs> I need